you very much indeed. Um, well, you, you've had a, a, a talk from David Gordon, which has really set the scene. And now I want to talk about the specific issue of standards in medical education. And I want to argue that this is really a case for being different. So there are ideas of globalization that seem to suggest that there is one best way for medical education. However, globalization is generally about fitting medical education and graduates into a Western model. Regulation tends to imply in people's minds the compliance with set standards. But does that compliance deny local autonomy? If it does, that cannot be the right thing. Standards sometimes suggest that we know the best way to design and to conduct education. But medical education, and all of you will know this, tends to be a follower of fashion. And that fashion is normally a Western fashion. There really is very little, if any, robust evidence that one approach to education is better than another. And for those of us who are social scientists, I'm an educational psychologist, that is the nature of social science. So this is a problem for standard setters. So the questions are these. How can we meet standards while being true to our culture, our profession, our context, our individuality? How can we enable many types of medical school, research orientated medical schools, community orientated medical schools, specialty orientated medical schools? How can we have that rich mix of all types of medical school that any country needs? And how can we enable many types of curriculum, additional curriculum? There is not much evidence that there's much wrong with that. An integrated curriculum, different models of learning. How can we, by setting standards, enable people to choose which of these approaches they would like to have? We live in an era of regulation. We live in an era of regulation. Oh my goodness, of regulation. And regulation is based on standards. But if regulation is based on standards, does that mean standardization? Does that mean everybody has to be the same? I want to look at that. So let's look at what standardization actually is. And this is where all... So is standardiz standardization about making everything the same? Well, no. Is it about making everything of the same type have the same basic features? Well, no. Is developing standards... Um, is it about developing standards that represent accepted good practice? Well possibly but what is good practice is it about and behind that it, it should say is it about compliance with what is it about compliance with something that is set somewhere else no should standards mean lack of local autonomy no should it simply mean meeting a standard in some way well, yes, of course, it should. And we're going to define what we mean by that. And that is always rule number one. And those of you who I know are involved in our master's degree know that rule number one is define your terms. So let's look at that. What is a standard? Well, standards came out of industry. And indeed, a lot of what's said in, in medical education comes out of contexts that are not like medical education. So uh, in the 19th century, there were industrial processes that required well control oh, that required well controlled production um, to deliver a predictable product that complied with specifications. 
But what happened was they invented standards for screw threads, for example, the Whitworth thread, and they thought this is great. But then suddenly there were standards for the pipe thread, standards for British Association screw threads, for cycle threads. There was an American, American Unified Course standard. There was a British thread bind standard. So what was developed to make gunboats in the Crimea work actually no longer worked. A standard was not one thing. So if that's the case for something practical like a screw thread, what hope is there for education? There are problems with industrial standards. They give you an industrial mindset. They tend to split things up to high, um, high amounts of detail that then can't be added together. They are often isolated from complex systems. And for us, there is an imperfect knowledge base. Science, social science has very few truths. So it's unsafe to recommend any educational practice to anyone else. Inability to reflect diverse and unique intentions is what would happen if we had specific standards that everybody had to meet and insensitivity to contextual and cultural factors uh, factors so we don't want over specification we don't want lack of ownership we don't want anything that stifles originality and creativity we don't want to focus on compliance that is a really stultifying thing and if standards are global, then these problems are often amplified. So standardization in education is not like standardization in industry. Standardization in education should lead to local creativity, local choice, local relevance, whereas standardization in industry leads to cloning of process and product. So we in education are trying to do a different thing. And that's why standards in education must allow local decision making be relevant and contextually flexible. So the World Federation for Medical Education recognized these problems and we asked ourselves, how can we use standards but avoid industrial standardization? And in answering that question, we have developed the 2020 revised edition of the WFME standards for basic medical education. And as you've heard, we are now devising standards for distributed and distance learning. We will be going on to look at our standards for postgraduate medical education. So we decided on a new edition of the WFME standards and the reasons for that were that we recognised differences, differences in available resources. We recognise that the more detailed standards are, the more they lead to compliance behaviour, and that doesn't lead to productive change. There are different, different contextual factors in healthcare and in education, lack of robust evidence about educational effectiveness, and much of education is culturally and contextually determined. What feedback means in the West has very different contextual meanings elsewhere, for example. And we wanted to avoid what Alan Bleakley has called, and I'm sure you've read about, medical education imperialism. Standards should not be prescriptive. We wanted standards that allow and guide local institutions to make and defend their own contextually relevant decisions about these eight areas. In the previous set of standards, there were nine, but we've amalgamated two that were much the same. So the new standards look at mission and values, curriculum, assessment, students and their role, academic staff, educational resources, quality assurance, and governance and administration. So those standards need to allow and guide local institutions to make and defend their own te 
contextually relevant decisions. So appropriate standards, and if these slides um, had worked properly, um, you would be able to read this. I hope I can remember what it says. If I can't, we'll make it up. So appropriate standards should allow transparent regulation, of course. They should ensure that institutes are, institutions are all equally accountable. They should ensure that institutions have autonomy in local decision making, which leads to a variety of educational decisions. And they should offer guidance in educational design, management and quality assurance. So standards do not mean industrial standardization. Given that, we have to ask ourselves, ourselves what type of standard might be appropriate. There are different types of standard. There are process-based standards that lead to a precise definition of structures and functions and how many board rubbers you need. There are principle-based standards which are high-level concepts of good practice, which leaves details of decision-making to the local um, institution. There are outcomes-based standards which focus on what graduates could do in our context, not on how they learn to do it. And there are risk-based standards, which in industry and particularly in banking are, and in the law also are, um, are very popular. But they focus on areas of practice that give rise to most risks. In our area, we cannot be sure what gives rise to most risks. So current preferred models, if you look around the world, are often specify precise outcomes or processes regulators often choose hybrid prescriptive models they take a view about what's best to do even though there's no robust evidence and very often they use prescriptive standards that are easy to regulate but might not enable any institution or indeed a regulator to see beyond compliance so there's a standard for regulators and for standards. There's a problem for regulators and standard setters as well. And that is that there are fashions in education, which I'm a developmental psychologist. Fashions in education, even in university education, follow on from fashions in child rearing. There's no evidence to suggest that one educational approach is more effective than another, but one will be more fashionable than another for contextual social reasons, but those contextual social factors are different in different places. So setting prescriptive standards, how you should do it, is time bound and it's risky. So WFME took a very different view. We wanted to enable local decision making in all key areas of educational design and activity because only your context can tell you what is right for you. WFME is not prescriptive because ideas in education change, ideas in education are socially constructed. And what is right for one place is not right for another. There are, and I'm sorry about this slide as well, there are changing social values as well, which is why the, the difference isn't just between country and country and culture and culture. It's a difference in time and it's a difference within any one society. There are, oh, sorry about this, there are changing social values. There are dominant values held by most people. There are emerging values held by a growing number. number there are oppositional values that are held in direct opposition to the majority and there are alternative values unchallenging alternative views to the majority and at any one time in any one country or any one context or indeed globally you will find all of these and you have to decide which ones you will go with so we have chosen principles-based standards because they are the most contextually sensitive. They suggest overarching requirements that can be applied flexibly where you are, whether it's within a country or within a school. They are qualitative and not quantitative. 
They don't tell you how many meters you need per student. They will engage institutions in making contextual decisions. And that means that when institutions must comply with standards, that is meaningful. It is not mechanistic. And it streamlines requirements. It reduces complexity and atomization. And our standards, our principles-based standards, are the basis for an open dialogue with stakeholders and regulators. So WFME has prepared its 2020 standards, which are now on our website, guide institutions to address all the necessary components of the, curri of the curriculum purposes, outcomes, processes, management and quality. Our standards enable each institution to reach its own contextually appropriate designs and processes and enable regulators to make decisions about the quality of medical education offered. So an effective set of standards sets a framework for planning, analysis and development. It covers the entire relevant realm. It doesn't address trivial areas of kettle counting, so many of this and so many meters of that. They're manageable in numbers, they encourage local variation and autonomy and choice, and they avoid bureaucratic compliance responses. So our new standards for each of those eight areas that I listed, we have set out the importance of the area why regulators or medical schools should think about this aspect of their provision. We have written the standards for that area, we have given guidance about each standard, and then we have offered key questions to ask when using each standard. And I should say this, we, uh, the core group was me, uh, John Nossini, and Professor Michael Field, um, who is from uh, Sydney in Australia. We worked on these very, very hard, and then we put them out for consultation, and we had advice from well over 100, maybe nearer 150 people, institutions. We then took all of those opinions into account, and that has come up with our final set. And here's an example. So I took randomly the standards for academic staff. So we have said the importance of this area is that there should be the adequate numbers of well-trained and committed academic staff, sometimes people refer to these as faculty or teachers, supported by technical and administrative staff are critical to the effective delivery of the curriculum. So that is a simple, obvious, clear statement about academic staff, their responsibilities, our duties and their context. One of the standards is this, the academic staff establishment policy, that the school has a number and range of qualified academic staff required to put the school's curriculum into practice, given the number of students and style of teaching and learning. So this means that schools, or regulators, whoever it is, has, they have to think very carefully about each of these issues. And so then we've offered guidance. We have said determining academic staff establishment policy involves considering the number, level and qualifications of academic staff required to deliver your planned curriculum to your intended number of students and the distribution of academic staff by grade and experience. If you look at that guidance, it addresses everything that you need to know about setting out the outline for the uh, academic staffing of your organisation. And then we've put in some key questions. How did the school arrive at the required number and characteristics of their academic staff? So we need explanations for the decisions made. And how do the number and characteristics of the academic staff align with the design, the delivery and the quality assurance of the curriculum? So our new principles-based standards ask those questions very, very clearly, and we expect and hope that people will find them very useful in deriving their own solutions for their own context. Again, I'm sorry about this. 
So the revised WFME standards <coughs> address eight areas of educational design and implementation, focusing on those types of principle. They do not specify any particular practice or provision or outcome. They guide decision making for local interpretation. They recognize diversity and difference in the need for local and contextual relevance. And they expect everyone and help everyone to reach their own contextually relevant decisions and describe their own rationale. So this moves towards local ownership and development of decision-making skills, it moves away from mechanistic compliance and it should result in a rich diversity of appropriate educational designs and practices. The more variety, the better. And in my country, in the United Kingdom, we've got medical schools which are the most traditional and we've got medical schools which are quite quirky, quite unusual. And they all have an important role and give choice both to the academics and to the students in what they're trying to do. So common principles based standards enable individual expression in each local context and set of conditions. And that is what we at WFME have tried to do and will continue to try to do. And that will lead to transparent decision making and planning because you have to think, how am I going to do this here? It enables local flexibility and relevance. It ensures ownership of the process and the product of education. You are not doing it for someone else. You are doing it for yourself. And that leads to transparent creativity. And it does not lead to compliance behavior that is meaningless. So effective standards in education are not everyone doing the same thing. Effective standards lead to individual contextually appropriate design, which might be totally different from everyone else's. It leads to a rich variety of educational provision and choice, and that's needed because medicine has many different roles. It requires the big researchers as well as the sympathetic teachers. It requires the production of people for tertiary care as well as primary care and the community. So standardization in our terms is actually meeting flexible standards appropriately for your context. Thank you.